Hi, and welcome to my floss tube channel. I'm Jean Farish, and I am so glad that you're here with me today. I'm going to start by sharing um, yet another trip that I have planned for this fall, and that's in October of 2021, this year. And I am, you know, I keep saying I am so excited about this trip and that trip and the other trip, and I am excited about all of them. I, I just can't wait to get out and about and to travel and to spend time with my favorite people, which are stitchers. So this one is also being planned by RGE Travels, and it's going to be, the, the essence of the trip is to see the Redwoods by train and to go to wineries. And um, on board with the trip, we're going to have a wine expert with us, and I will be there to teach needlework and to um, kind of be there for a stitch along and casual stitching time. The, um, the trip officially begins in San Francisco on October 15th. We're gonna go to Yosemite, we're gonna go to Sonoma, we're gonna go to Napa and all kinds of interesting things in between. I'm actually gonna begin the trip in Denver and I invite you to, to initiate the, your travel at that point as well. I'm going to travel by um, Amtrak's um, California Zephyr, and that's an overnight train ride that's going to go through just, oh, I just cannot Im imagine just some of the most amazing scenery that this country has to offer. So the Denver part of the trip will actually begin very early in the morning on October 14th, and then we will travel overland and overnight to San Francisco where we will rejoin or join up with everybody else who's who's coming on the trip. So you've got an option to either start the trip in San Francisco or Denver. Um, trip is limited to 40 some people. So um, it's gonna be first come first serve. Registration is gonna open on May 15th. And the person to contact for information is Ray at RGE Travels. And I will include his contact information in today's episode description. So I think that's pretty much wraps up what I'm going to be doing this fall and into next year, uh, which is certainly a gracious plenty uh, to get started with as we re-enter the real world and can see people face to face as well as as we are here, which is meaningful. Don't don't get me wrong. I, I hope that we will continue with this kind of virtual relationship. But, um, you know, it's just gonna be really nice to be face-to-face -face with people as well. So I'm taping this before I actually have all of the third installment of Roxy done, but I thought I would share it with you today um, and show you the two stitches that, that we've added in this segment, and that's the rice stitch and the Algerian eyelet. So the rice stitch um, is this strawberry right here, and I have uh, elected to do it in a checkerboard fashion with, with two colors, but um, it's really an interesting stitch. It's, it's um, kind of an embellished cross stitch. You start with a, with, a, with a large cross stitch that's over four threads, or if you're working on Aida, two squares by two squares, and then each of the legs is crossed yet again. So it gives you just this really nice texture. So that's the rice stitch. And then like many samplers, there is an Algerian eyelet alphabet. And this is an alphabet that you see in Roxana Corson, which is kind of the great grandmother of Roxy and um, Janet Irving, lots of antique samplers have Algerian eyelet alphabets. Sometimes it's the whole alphabet, sometimes it's just a few letters. Um, and so that's that's what we have going on here. Now, I also just wanted to show you, this is where last week I took out a slub in anticipation of doing the alphabet. And I was hoping by today to actually have this part stitched so you could see um, how the slub did not interfere with it. Um, but obviously I didn't get that done. So I have the F and by the time I get to the G, it will be stitched over that area where I removed the majority of the slub. 
So I, so I thought today that I would talk to you about eyelet stitches in general. And an eyelet stitch can be a square, it can be a diamond shape, it can be a triangle, it can be a circle, it can be an irregular shape. Um, but regardless of what the outside shape of the eyelet is, there are certain elements that are true of all eyelets. And so that's kind of what I want to emphasize today. First of all, it is a pulled thread stitch and the extent to which the stitches are pulled is going to determine the size of the actual eyelet in the center of the stitch. Um, the more you pull, the larger that eyelet will be. So when you have a project that has multiple eyelets in it, then the goal would be for all of them to be consistent. So it doesn't matter if two people who are stitching the exact same chart, it doesn't matter whether or not their eyelets match or not, but within your own project to try to keep your eyelets of a consistent size. So I recommend that whenever you're doing something that's gonna have lots of eyelets is to do a little bit of practice and decide for yourself how big you want that eyelet to be. So here are kind of the, the general um, kind of rules for pretty eyelets. One is consistency. The other is that when you, as you take each stitch, you're stitching into the center of the eyelet from the outside edge into the center and pulling away from the eyelet. And I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. So that's one thing is take each stitch into the center Second thing is that when you have other stitching around your eyelids uh, to make sure that your traveling threads do not block or obscure or in any way interfere with the eyelid that you just worked so hard to get. So to, you want to keep that eyelid hole clear. Um, it doesn't matter when you're doing an eyelid whether you're stitching clockwise or counterclockwise but it is important that once you start an eyelet that you work all the way around and you don't, you don't skip around. So like you don't do north, south, east, and west, and then go back and fill in in between them. You're gonna, wherever you start, you do each stitch going all the way around. Now, because a eyelet stitch is a pulled thread stitch, even if you're starting with two strands, you can't use a loop method to begin with you're gonna to need to use what I call an away waist knot. And that's when you put your waist knot quite a distance away from where you plan on stitching. So let's assume if this is gonna be where I'm, I need to stitch. I have learned to train myself to leave at least the distance of four fingers from where I plan on stitching, simply because I had a bad habit of not leaving a long enough distance because with an away waist knot, what I'm gonna do when I'm finished is to clip this knot, re-thread the tail in the eye of my needle, and then bury the beginning of my thread in much the same manner that I would normally bury the end of it. And I kept being awfully skimpy, and so what would happen is I'd have this little tiny uh, length of thread to thread into the eye of my needle, and that made it hard. So. An eyelid stitch, in the case of an Algerian eyelid, has just eight stitches. So I'm going to start with what we think of as being the nine o'clock position on a clock face. And from there, I'm going clockwise up here to what's going to become the corner of my stitch and back into the middle. And I'm pulling away, I'm pulling this thread away from the hole as I'm stitching. And so from there, back into the center. Keep in mind that the eyelet hole is gonna get larger with each additional stitch. So don't try to make it as big as you want it to be with your first couple of stitches. It's gonna get bigger with each additional stitch.
So here I am making the corner stitch here. And now into what's going to be the six o'clock position. Always back into the middle with each stitch. And now my last stitch in the bottom left hand corner of the square Algerian eyelet. So that's one stitch. Now let's say if, for example, um, I want a larger eyelet. So I'm going to come down here and basically do the same thing. Now this time I'm going to do it as a sewing motion instead of poking and pulling. And that doesn't necessarily make it easier to have a large eyelet hole, but I kind of wanted to kill two birds with one stone as the saying goes. So to make a larger eyelet, all I'm doing is pulling each stitch harder as I pull away from the center. And when I uh, do this in a sewing motion, as you can see, I, I tend to turn my project around as I'm stitching. And here I am back to the beginning and my last stitch. Now I think that hole looks a little bit bigger, but this is why I say you would need to practice. Um, let me slip something white underneath this and see if, yeah, that makes it easier to see the hole. So you can see that the second one is a little bit bigger. So if I were doing a project that was gonna have, say a whole alphabet of Algerian uh, eyelets, I would want to practice first. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the larger the eyelet hole, the less the color thread is going to show. So if you're doing something like an alphabet, you may want to throttle back and have a more moderate size eyelet hole um, just so that more of the color is going to show. So that's the Algerian eyelet. And like I say, there's lots of different shapes and different types of eyelets. One the same size, but that has um, a stitch in between every thread. So I would have 16 stitches rather than eight. Uh, it's no longer called an Algerian eyelid. It would then be called a square eyelid. Um, and it would just have a lusher, um, more filled out look to it. Way back in January, I mentioned that I was going to have specials every once in a while. Actually, I think I may have promised to do it once a month. And here it is May 1st, and I'm only doing the second one. So I apologize for letting time just slip through my fingers like that. But here I am, May 1st, and I want to offer for the month of May um, a special based on this sampler, Oops. which I designed for the 2017 Citrus Escapes cruise to New England and Canada. Now this is under glass, so I don't, I don't know how well it's gonna show here, but I'm gonna make a couple of changes um, from the original here. Uh, primarily, I'll take out the cruise ship that was representing um, our, our voyage for this cruise. Um, and I'm taking out the names of the cities that we visited as well as Citrus Escapes Cruise. And I'm making those changes really for two reasons. One is that uh, I, I made this original one as a commemoration for the trip that we took in 2017. Um, and so I wanna keep that original chart version special for the people who were on that cruise. And the second thing, of course, is that um, it's not relevant to the overall design. So, of course, once I took the ship out, then there was a gap. And so I just added more, more houses in the central area. But I just love this quote from Longfellow. And this comes from a much longer poem of his. 
my soul is full of longing for the secret of the sea and the heart of the great ocean sends a thrilling pulse through me. That's going to be um, offered for the month of May for $4.40 as a way of celebrating my 40th year as a designer and teacher. And um, so take advantage of that if, if you would like to. It's going to be in my Etsy store. And then later on, uh, the print version will also be available in local needlework store shops. It won't be for four dollars and forty cents, but you know, if you want that little extra bargain, then take advantage of it now. So now on to some FAQs. This was a question from Carolyn. She said, "Can you frame a piece under glass if it has a bead on it, such as used for a French knot?" And actually, my answer would be true. Uh, would apply whether you're using beads or actually French knots. Keep in mind that a good framer is always going to use a spacer between your needlework and your and the glass so that it will breathe. So you should always have a spacer anyway. And the spacers come in different heights. So they should choose the whatever height spacer is going to allow your beads to rest undisturbed by the glass being pressed down on top of it. You don't want the glass to be pressing down on top of it. So again, a good framer is gonna know to do that. So that's, that makes it an easy answer. Actually, in a question I had last week, um, Tommy Jane had sent in a picture of my weather vane horse, which I shared with you, that she stitched on a beautiful red linen, but I didn't know what color she stitched the horse in. And she responded to me and let me know that it was DMC 3866. So if anybody wants to replicate that same color scheme, that's what, that's what she used. I got a great question from Lois. She left a wonderful comment for me and actually left several questions in it. So here's part of it. Someone asked you a question about replacing needles with every new project. I think someone may be confusing hand embroidering with machine embroidering. With machine embroidering, due to the high speed of the machine, the heat produced as a needle penetrates the fabric and the abrasive nature of the stabilizers used Machine embroidery needles dull very easily and must re be replaced quite frequently. And I thought about that, and that could be the source of some of the confusion. Um, but, you know, who knows? And finally, here's another part of um, Lois's comment. She said, um, One subject in particular that I noticed you haven't addressed is intellectual property rights. I know that you specialize in reproducing vintage sampler charts, the originals dating back to the 1800s for the most part. However, I know that there are vintage charts that are still under copyright protection, and those are the ones that have been created after the 1930s, not to mention your own charts, meaning my own charts. I think it's really important that people be aware that sharing charts is not okay. So here's, here's my reply. To Lois, I said, as much as I'm willing to stick my neck out and offer my viewpoint on controversial issues, I'm not willing to make statements about what is legal and what is not any more than I am willing to make questions about what is the proper medical procedure or not. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I am a needlework designer with lots of experience. And when it comes to copyright, then yes, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and that is why, for example, in my copyright statement on everything I sell and even the things I give away, I say that you have the right as a purchaser to make a working copy of my design. So that if you do want to make a working copy and you don't have a copier of your own and you go to a commercial printing place and ask them to make a copy, then you should not be refused. Um, so that's, that's one area that I think is, gets sticky, but I think that I really want to make it clear that even if you are giving away a project, um, you cannot make a copy of a legitimate chart and give it away for free. So the whole argument of, I didn't make any money just doesn't wash. I, I will go out on enough of a legal limb to say that. Um, and the other thing too, I am aware that there are people that are out there that are very deliberately, um, 
making copies of legitimate charts to which they have no right and selling them as being legitimate charts. And that's where it is really tough to be a consumer. So how do you know you're buying a real chart? First of all, if possible, make your purchase from a company that is legitimate, that, that you know is ethical and honest. Buy it from directly from the designer's own website. Buy it from the website of a shop or a online business that is that has built a credible reputation. Um, when you buy charts from eBay, um, yes, you are you are taking a chance. When you buy a chart even on Etsy from a seller that's not the designer, then yes, you are taking a chance. And you're not gonna know until you get the chart in your hands whether or not it's the real McCoy or not. And many people have been burned um, by making such purchases. And then when they get it, um, the copy is so blurry they can hardly read it or pages are missing or whatever. And I know that that's a whole nother topic. So I guess what I'm, what I want to say is I have sympathy for you, the consumer to not always know that you're buying an illegal copy if indeed that's what happens. So I do recognize that that, that, that is something that can occur that even if you are trying very hard to do the right thing, to do the legal thing, that sometimes you might find yourself buying a copy that's not legal. So when that happens, then, you know, it's like my heart goes out to you because I know how bad that would make me feel if I were in your shoes. Um, at the same time, you know, we designers kind of have to stand up for each other and and, and help each other out and recognize if somebody is out there selling counterfeit copies of our, of our work. Because, you know, when you're sitting there stitching it and it's, you know, a little mouse peeking out of a bucket or something, you might say, oh, this is such a simple little thing. You know, anybody could design it. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, please become a designer, but don't minimize our talent by, making copies and giving them away. So, but I guess one other thing to say about this before I, I leave the topic, um, the one thing I will step up and say that yes, once you have made a purchase of a legitimate chart, not a PDF, that's a whole nother ball game here. But when you have bought a printed published chart and you are finished with it, and you want to give it away or sell it, you certainly can, but you may not make a copy and keep it for yourself. And you may not make a copy and give that to a friend. So yes, when you buy the original, um, my understanding is that yes, you have the legal right to sell it or give it away the original, but only if you do not keep a copy for yourself. So, oh boy, I hope that I'm not going to get mail about this topic, but if I do, I do. So, anyway, I like ending episodes on a positive or more uplifting thought. So, let's flip this whole thing on its head and let me share with you that I believe that 99.9% .9 of cross-stitchers want to support their favorite designers. They want to support legitimate shops, be they real brick and mortar shops or online shops and buy only legitimate charts. So why all this comment on the negative? I think it's more, well, my intention is more a matter of education so that you know what to look for and so that you know what your rights as a consumer are while still respecting the rights of designers 
and all the other people in the industry who make their living from what designers create. So um, <clears throat> I want to thank the 99.9% .9 of you who are out there seeking legitimate sources for your charts, kits, whatever, um, and continue to, to support this industry that, that we all love. So I guess that's really the bottom line to me and maybe why I don't um, talk about it all that much is that I really do believe that most people know what the right thing is and um, ignore all the noise that's made by others who frankly don't know the legalities but very often speak as if they are the one and only source of what is legal. Um, and of course, I'm speaking of copyright law in the US. There are international laws protecting international property. And of course, each country has their own their own laws. So let's see what else. Summer's coming. Our weather has been glorious. I am back out walking. I have become way too sedentary in the last year. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I have friends that have used um, this year of seclusion to get fit. And I have friends who have used this year to sit around and stitch and read and have put on a few pounds and I'm in that category. So I am busy walking it off. And so I, I hope that as the weather is improving in your neighborhood, that you're getting out and about and um, taking care of your own health and of course, as always, stitch happy and stay safe. I'll see you next week.